All right, so we're going to continue our lecture on sacral fractures. Uh, in the first uh, video, we talked mostly about uh, classifications and indications. Uh, we're going to talk more now about the fixation types um, that are available. So why use percutaneous um, iliosacral screw fixation posteriorly? Well, it may be a uh, surgeon preference. Uh, or you may have a case where open reduction is simply not desirable, like an open pelvic fracture. There are many requirements for percutaneous fixation. For instance, the anatomy uh, has to be amenable to it. So for instance, uh, sacral dysmorphism might make it difficult. You have to have very good radiology to see what you're doing. Uh, and you have to have the uh, ability to do this safely and uh, to be able to get a good reduction. So you have to be aware of many things. Um, <clears throat> just just a list of many of the things. And this is the, this is the one thing I think uh, you have to really look out for um, and uh, be able to recognize, which is a sacral dysmorphism. So a few words about screw orientation. Um, so very often if you have a vertical sacral fracture, kind of like this shown here, right, we have this fracture here, uh, it can be preferable to place the screw perpendicular to that in this direction. Whereas if you have an SI joint dislocation, right, with the SI joint is oriented this way, it may be more preferable to have a screw oriented this way. So depending on what you're treating, orientation may be beneficial. The other thing is you have to keep in mind, and I'll move to the next picture, is that if you're placing a screw transversely, it could be an opportunity to place it all the way into the other sac into the other ileum, so like a transsacral, transiliac um, uh, screw, uh, which is something you cannot do when you orient a screw this way. Okay. Um, and of course, if you have a, a, a pelvis that has dysmorphism and you sort of have, and we'll go over this later, you have this sort of scalloping here, you, you may not be able to safely place that uh, horizontal screw all the way across. Okay, and that just kind of shows what it would look like on a CT scan. So intraoperatively, you need inlet, outlet, and lateral sacral views to be able to safely do this. So you need, this is where you need good imaging. You gotta be able to see that sacral frame in there. You gotta be able to get a good assessment of um, the um, sacrum on the, that inlet view and also being able to truly appreciate that you have pretty good lateral image here and you can truly see that uh, iliac cortical density, which we'll go over in a little bit. Now, if you do have computer navigation, that can make it easier. Uh, another thing that can make it easier is uh, intraoperative 3D imaging, uh, something that you know, we've been using at our center. So you can place your pen and then sort of get uh, the equivalent of a, almost like a CT scan to see where that pin is uh, rather than just the radio, rather than just the CRM images alone. But if you have navigation, it allows you to uh, sort of uh, safely uh, direct your pin um, uh, based on uh, sort of this like 3D rendering or where the pin might be heading uh, using navigational tools. So if you were to get a uh, sort of a uh, section of the sacrum uh, and cross section, this is kind of something what you might be looking at. And this white area in here would be sort of your safe zones. Anything inside here would potentially be safe. If you're going to put two screws, I mean, this might be two spots to put it. And then an S2, a sm slightly smaller target. Um, so you notice that you really don't want to be placing a screw like up in this in this corner or too far back here, right? You want to sort of get it right in the middle. And here's one of the reasons, right? So if you are too close to this um, anterior corner here, you can see that, uh, you know, you can uh, kind of go, you can kind of go in, out, in, and what is this? This is the L5 nerve root, right? So the L5 nerve root sits on top of, as you saw in the previous, I'm going to go back, you saw in this previous cross section right here, the L5 nerve root sits right here. Okay, it's this, I'm going to color it in red, but it's this, this sitting right there. Okay, so let's go forward now. So it's basically sitting on top of the sacral ala. Okay, it's resting right in here on this view. Okay, and... Uh, if you're not careful, you can kind of go in, out, hit the nerve root, and go back in. <coughs> Something like that. So this this thing here, 
this thing here behind where, where the nerve is sitting on, that shelf is going to help form that iliac cortical density. So here you can see in this dashed line between numbers 1 and 2 is that iliac cortical density. Above that is the nerve, and the pin needs to stay behind it, okay, or posterior to that. And here you can see it again here, iliac cortical density, uh, screw sitting behind it, okay. And here you can see example of the sciatic notches, uh, not perfectly superimposed, right? So it's not, it could be a slightly better lateral image. It looks a little better here. And when you place the iliosacral screws, it's going to look a little bit something like this, right? So you, here you have inlet, AP, outlet, views, right? And this is kind of what you want to be looking at on the standard views. But again, keep in mind, standard CRM imaging can still um, hide a uh, an errant screw and that's where you still need to get some kind of 3D imaging by CT scan or maybe a 3D intra-op uh, fluoro image. Alright, so let me move on talk a little bit more about open approaches and uh, other, techn other techniques other than iliosacral screws. So um, open posterior approach can have the advantage of giving you complete access to the posterior ring, can allow you to do de decompression of neurologic injuries. The disadvantages are you have to be prone, and the soft tissues here are not that forgiving. You don't have great soft tissue coverage over the sacrum posteriorly. But when you're going to do this, it's going to be uh, an incision off of the uh, PSIS prominence. You're going to maintain a full thickness flap. You elevate the gluteus maximus off its origin, and then you're going to elevate the um, potentially up to the gluteus medius and uh, distal dissection of the gluteus maximus. If you have to, then you palpate the uh, you can palpate the SI joint through the uh, greater sciatic notch if necessary. So here's one example. If you're going to do this through a uh, vertical incision, just to kind of give you your landmarks of where you are. Um, here you'll be able to uh, uh, palpate the uh, PSIS. Actually, this is not a midline incision. I'm going to imagine the center of the patient is actually more like here. This is not my drawing. Okay, and this is the PSIS, and then this is the incision lateral to it. I would typically do it a little bit more oblique, but that's one way to do it. That's your incision. So, um, <clears throat> your next step is to raise a uh, medial subcutaneous flap. So, here you're going to see um, kind of cephalad where the incision might come in. Okay, this is going to be the, right here is going to be the PSIS, and also showing caudad, and the GM is your gluteus maximus, which is, you need to you need to elevate off, right? And that's going to look something a little bit like this. So this is before you elevate your GMAX. So you elevate, so the next step is you elevate your gluteus insertion, you know, from the iliac crest, and all the way down towards your fascial insertion, and off the erector spinae muscle. So that's you know, GMAX kind of has this broad origin here, and then you can elevate off the outer table of the ilium, and then deeper you're going to do, you can dissect the gluteus medius uh, as you uh, continue to go uh, along the iliac cr crest outer table. Now you can do a midline posterior approach as well. Um, this is kind of shown in this uh, image to the right here. Uh, this is a case where you may do, for instance, if you're uh, dealing with an, like a U-shaped sacral fracture and, or you need to do some kind of lumbopelvic fixation uh, and decompress everything and uh, place your instrumentation, this is one way you might have to do that. What about posterior transiliac plating? So this is something that um, is an alternative to iliosacral screws. You may do it, for instance, in cases where you have poor imaging or sacral dysmorphism. It's kind of a, like plating in many cases, it's kind of a utilitarian technique. It's not as anatomic, uh, you know, it doesn't have as much anatomic requirement. You can, they're malleable plates, so you can get them to fit the situation. They can provide somewhat of a tension band effect. Uh, you can use them in bilateral sacral fractures and non-union non cases. Typically they're going to be placed through uh, two incisions. Usually, you know, it's going to be one incision here, one incision here, something like that. Um, uh, you, if you're not careful, you can over compress the uh, sacral fracture. Um, and I, I would agree with this, control of superior and posterior migration is a little bit limited, but it can be improved if you also add iliosacral screws. 
So with the technique, again, you have to be prone. It's an open approach. You're going to make two incisions. You could do one transverse incision, but you can often make you know, two incisions, one here and one here, and then you kind of like tunnel underneath. Um, and uh, you, if you have to, you can osteotomize the PSIS. That's uh, one technique I've done frequently, take an osteotome and create a little recessed trough. Um, so that the tunneling is a little bit easier and you don't have to have this uh, sort of like double bend in the plate. Uh, and usually it's a 3 5 recon plate. Um, you can also sort of do this, I'm going to erase this here, this so called home run screw where you go from the PSIS into the ilium this way. Okay. And you can com combine it with other techniques. If you leave room, you can still put an ileocecal screw in. All right. So let's move on to direct sacral reduction in plating. This is something that's done, I think, fairly infrequently. Uh, it's going to be done through posterior approach. You may do it for a transverse fracture, maybe an atypical fracture that you need to open and get reduced. The problem is the sacral ala is thin, right? So you're working on the sacral ala. You're placing fixation, as you can see here. The plates are typically placed, you know, posteriorly, and um, uh, you know, these are cases where, uh, again, if you need to get direct reduction, direct fixation, right? So if you have a fracture like this, right? So this sort of atypical fracture, and you need to get in there and you need to reduce it, um, then uh, you may have to uh, then go ahead and directly plate it uh, in order to prevent uh, loss of reduction by placing the plates in, in, in this type of orientation. And then you have spinal pelvic fixation. So in this case, as shown, you can do that through a midline uh, approach, sacral nerve root decompression. Perhaps you have to do something like uh, like this, where you have to go ahead and reduce the fracture, uh, but then you are doing this sort of bypass technique, right? Where you go from L5 or L4 and L5 into the ilium, right? And here you can see it's combined with bilateral iliosacral screws, right? You can see there's these iliosacral screws placed across. I think it's two different screws. So this provides strong fixation. It, it allows for immediate weight bearing. Um, unfortunately, there is an increased increase complication reoperation rate, and you often have to remove the implants, okay? Um, indications are transforaminal or some type two fractures that are, not, that are like vertically unstable. Uh, and they're also useful useful for uh, U and uh, H-shaped uh, sacral fractures. So here's an example again where you have um, you have a pelvic ring injury, but then you also have a, a, a sacral fracture, probably a U-shaped type injury with this um, um, sort of type three um, Roy Camille. Uh, type injury treated with uh, what I didn't show here, all the reduction um, intraoperatively uh, maneuvers, and then treated with uh, ilio trans iliac transecal screw and uh, this um, uh, lumbopelvic um, construct. All right? You can see some Im improved alignment on the post-reduction CT. Another term you might hear is triangular osteosynthesis. Now, actually, there was an example back here. Uh, right here. So this is an example of a triangular osteosynthesis where you have an iliosacral screw with a unilateral L5 to S1, I'm sorry, L5 to um, the ilium um, spanning. So this is done for, for instance, a case like this, right? Bad vertical sacral fracture um, treated with iliosacral screw, right? And then this lumbopelvic construct to bypass the um, sacral fracture, okay? Here's another nice example of that triangular osteosynthesis. So pretty strong way, uh, strong technique uh, biomechanically, especially if you need to get these patients up and weight bearing on it. Problem is complications, right? So in this small case series, 33% of patients had broken rods, 44% had uh, secondary operation. Here you can see an example of the broken rods here and here. Um, you know, and, and the thing is, the the, the 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 these this part of the instrumentation instrumentation right here um, tends to be a little bit prominent. They kind of place them right into the PSIS. As you know, the PSIS is already fairly subcutaneous, I and mean, you may chew off a small amount of the bone there, but the implants and the rods themselves can be um, a little bit prominent in that area.
and require removal. So a few words on sacral dysmorphism before we finish. We've talked about it a little bit here and there, but I want to show some really you know, clear examples so you know what we're talking about. And again, what's happening is you're having a lumbarized S1 or sacralized L5. It poses risks for percutaneous iliosacral screw placement. Uh, and as I showed in a previous example, you can't really put transiliac transsacral screws through S1 in most cases of sacral dysmorphism. So here, if you look, you actually have a case where you have, uh, you kind of have this dysmorphism here, uh, but it's still like a lumbar body here. And you still have this kind of disc space here um, and sort of these large frames. So I'm going to erase that so you can get another look at it. Here you also have clearly um, a demonstration of these enlarged foramen, sort of that residual disc space, and you sort of have these downward sloping. I'm going to show it here, downward sloping um, uh, sacrum, um, as opposed to here, right? So I'm going to now compare it to sort of a normal, normal type here. So this is kind of more of a, your normal looking uh, sacral upper body. On, on outlet and inlet views, um, compare that to here, where you kind of have sort of, whoops, I'm going to make it a little bit easier to see. Um, we have a little bit of this residual um, uh, disc. You have these enlarged foramen. You have these mammillary bodies. And um, here you can kind of see um, kind of like this more scalloping, right, as opposed to as opposed to here, okay? And that's, again, where the L5 nerve root is sitting and can be more at risk. So here's an example on uh, CT scanning. You can see some of this, some of these arrows showing residual disc space in the um, sacrum. Here you can see sort of that uh, sort of uh, sloping of the, um, of the sacrum. Um, and uh, what you see in this uh, this view here is the iliac cortical density is all the way down here, right? As opposed to a normal case. This is a normal case here. So this is normal. And this is dysmorphic. Okay? So here you can see that it's really hard to work on that image on the left where you have that... Uh, oh yeah, cortical density all the way down there. Okay, another interesting thing you can see is sort of like you got this this case here where you sort of have this tongue and groove type SI joint, right? So that's another another slight unusual dysmorphic thing you might see. So when you have dysmorphism, uh, again, you can't put that transiliac transsacral screw, right? So here you can see this is normal, all right, and this is dysmorphic. Oops, dysmorphic. And here you can see how in the dysmorphic type, again, you have this big slope. No way you can place that transverse thing at S1, but you could possibly place it at the S2 level. Tight corridor, but that's a spot where you might be able to get it in. All right, so that's, that's where you can see the differences. And this is just one example. Other examples, like I showed you, you sort of have this more like this scalloping here of the uh, anterior part of the S1. All right, so here's another example where you can see sort of uh, that downward slope here. You got this residual disc space here and sort of these really enlarged sacral foramen. Okay, and then you got that mammillary body. So here in this example where you have dysmorphism, right, you have this dysmorphism here um, you have this uh, transiliac transsacral screw at the level of S2. All right, so I'm going to end there, and um, that's going to wrap it up. Thanks.